I'm so very thankful that you've allowed the hand of God to direct you to a date with destiny today. And it is my prayer that you will allow the Holy Spirit to touch your heart. The title of this message is You Are Eternally Secure in Christ and in Christ Alone. You are eternally secure in Christ and in Christ alone. Our text for this message is found in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. Would you pray with me? Father, in Christ's name, we thank You that before the foundation of the world, You knew that we would all be here today. Father, I'm aware of this assignment that is before me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Father, may not one word leave my tongue, but that it does not first come from thee to me. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You're eternally secure in Christ and in Christ alone. I take no credit for this outline, for I'm using it from Dr. John MacArthur's excellent commentary series on the book of Romans. For Christians, for those who are truly born again, verse 28 in Romans chapter 8 is the most glorious in all of Scripture. It is breathtaking in its magnitude. It encompasses absolutely everything that pertains to the believer's life. And we know, and we know are three simple words that express the Christian's absolute certainty of eternal security in the Holy Spirit. Paul is not expressing his personal intuitions or his opinions, but he's setting forth the inerrant truth of the Word of God. It is not Paul the man, but Paul the apostle, the channel of God's revelation who continues to declare the truth he has revealed from the Holy Spirit. He therefore asserts with God's own authority that as believers in Jesus Christ, we know beyond all doubt that every aspect of our lives is in God's hands and will be divinely used by our Lord not only to manifest His own glory but also to work out our own ultimate blessing. The phrase we know here carries the meaning of can know. Tragically, many Christians throughout the history of the church, including many in our own day, refuse to believe that God guarantees the believers eternal security. For me personally, the most miserable Christians I know who believe that they can lose their salvation at the drop of a hat. Such denial is tied to the belief that salvation is a cooperative effort between men and God. And although God will not fail on His side, man might. Thus the sense of insecurity. Belief in salvation by a sovereign God alone, however, leads to the confidence that salvation is secure because God who alone is responsible, can never, ever fail. Praise His holy name today. Beyond that theological consideration, Paul is saying that the truth of eternal security is clearly revealed by God to us so that all believers are able with certainty to know the comfort and the hope of that reality if they simply take God at His word. God's child need never ever fear being cast out of his heavenly father's house or fear losing their citizenship in his eternal kingdom of righteousness. Yes, Paul states it clearly in Romans 8, 28. And we know, and we know that all things work together for good. The extent of the Christian security is as limitless as its certainty is absolute. As with every other element of the believer's security, God is the guarantor. It is He who causes everything in the believer's life to eventuate in blessing. God brings about the good that comes to His people. His degree of security is actually carried out by the direct, personal, and gracious work of His divine Son and by His powerful Holy Spirit. The Bible says in Hebrews 7, 25, Therefore He is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through Him, since He always lives to make intercession for them. And we know that all 
things. All things is utterly comprehensive, having no qualifications, having no limits. Neither this verse nor its context allows for restrictions or conditions. All things is inclusive in the fullest possible sense. Nothing existing or occurring in heaven or in earth shall ever as Romans 8.39 says, shall ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What I'm saying to you today is simply this. You can never ever be taken out of the hands of the living God. Once you are truly born again, you cannot ever, ever, ever lose your salvation. Paul is not saying that God prevents His children from experiencing things that can harm them. He is rather attesting that the Lord takes all that He allows to come into our lives, all that He allows to happen to His beloved children, even the bad things, even the worst things. He turns those things ultimately into blessings. And in this same chapter, in Romans chapter 8, in verse 32, Paul asked this question, He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? No matter what our situation, no matter what our suffering, no matter what persecutions we must endure, no matter how many times we fail in sin, no matter how much pain we suffer, no matter how much lack of faith we have in those things as well as in all other things our gracious loving heavenly father will work to produce our ultimate victory and blessing the corollary of that truth is that nothing can ultimately ever work against us any temporary harm that we suffer will be used by god for our own benefit. The living God of heaven and earth allowed Paul to experience great hardship so that he would never exalt himself. And Paul asked God three times to remove his thorn in the flesh. God gave him a thorn in the flesh so that he would not glorify in himself, so that he would not brag about himself. And in 2 Corinthians ch chapter 12, verse 9, Paul says, and I quote, and he said to me, He's speaking of what God said to him. My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, he states, most gladly will I rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. God knows what is best for us, and He knows when to allow bad things to happen to us and when to allow good things to happen to us. All things include circumstances and events that are good and beneficial in themselves as well as those that are in themselves evil and harmful. And we know that all things work together for good. To work together translates suner jo, suner jo, from which is derived the English term synergism the working together of various elements to produce an effect greater than and often completely different from the sum of each element acting separately. God's providential power and His will causes all things to work together for good in the lives of His children. David testified to this marvelous truth in Psalm chapter 25, verse 10. Listen to what David says, and I quote, all the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth to such as keep His covenant and His testimonies. End of quote. No matter what happens in our lives, as God's children, the providence of God uses it for our temporal as well as for our eternal benefit. Sometimes by saving us from tragedies, saving us from ourselves, sometimes by sending us through them in order to draw us closer to Him. Our great God led His own children, the Israelites, through 40 years of difficulty and hardship to bring them good, the good that sometimes must come by way of divine discipline and refining. Even when our outward circumstances are dire, perhaps especially when they are dire and seemingly hopeless from our perspective. God is purifying. God is renewing our redeemed inner beings in preparation for glorification for our ultimate good. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. Therefore, 
we do not lose heart. Even though the outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. It is the goodness of God that leads us to repent of our sins. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, Or do you despise the riches of His goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Although the truth is often difficult to recognize and accept, the Lord causes even evil things to work for our good. It is these less obvious and less pleasant channels of God's blessing that Paul here seems to be emphasizing. Those things among the all things that are in themselves anything but good. Many of the things that we do and that happen to us are either outright evil or at best are worthless. Yet in His infinite wisdom and omnipotence, our Heavenly Father will turn even the worst of such things to our ultimate good. Praise His holy name today. You can never be separated from the love of Christ. God uses the evil of sin as a means of bringing good to His children. Sin is not good in itself because it is the antithesis of good. Yet, in God's infinite wisdom and power, it is most remarkable of all that He turns sin into our good. Our great God uses sin to bring good to His children by overruling our sin by canceling sin's normal evil consequences and by miraculously substituting His benefits because it is often easier for us to recognize the reality and the wickedness of sin in others than in ourselves. God can cause the sins of other people to work for our good. I know I've experienced it daily for many years now. And if we're seeking to live a godly life in Christ, seeing a sin in others, will make us hate and avoid it even more. A spirit of judgmental self-righteousness, of course, will have the opposite effect, leading us into the snare about which Paul has already warned. In Romans 2, verses 1 through 3, Paul states, Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice, the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Our great God can even cause our own sins to work for our good. Praise His holy name. The believer's sins are just as evil as those of unbelievers, but the ultimate consequence of a believer's sin is vastly different because the penalty for all of our sins, past, present, and future, have been paid in full by Jesus when He died on the cross at Calvary. I praise His holy name today that He loves us with an everlasting love, a love that will not end, a love that will never, ever, ever let us go. The Bible is true. The Bible is real. And the foundational truth of Romans 8 is that by God's unspeakable grace, a Christian is forever preserved from sin's ultimate consequence, which is eternal condemnation in the place called hell. But yet, a Christian is still subject to the immediate temporal consequences of sins that he commits, as well as to many continuing consequences of sins committed before salvation. The sinning believer is not spared God's chastisement, but the sinning believer is assured of God's chastisement as a remedial tool for producing holiness in our lives. This is the supreme good for which God causes our sin to work. He causes our own sin to work for our good by leading us to despise the sin and to desire His holiness in our lives. And we fall into sin our spiritual weakness becomes evident and we're driven humbly to seek God's forgiveness and to seek God's restoration. Evil as it is, sin can bring us good by stripping us of pride 
and self-assurance. The supreme illustration of God's turning all things, even the most evil of things, to the good of His children is seen in the sacrificial death of His Son Jesus on the cross at Calvary. Jesus said it so well in John 3, 16 when He said this, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. In the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, God took the most absolute evil that Satan could devise and turned it into the greatest conceivable blessing he could offer to fallen mankind eternal salvation from our sin. Have you ever reached the point in your life where you've repented of your sins and asked Jesus to forgive you and to be your Lord and Savior by faith. In just a few moments, I'm going to give you an opportunity to repent of your sins and accept Christ as your Lord and Savior by faith. If you've never made that decision, the greatest decision that a lost, a spiritual lost human being can ever make, I want to encourage you to make that decision. Make that choice today to give your heart and to give your life to Jesus Christ. This is why the true child of God is eternally secure in Christ and in Christ alone. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God. Who are they? These are the men, women, the boys and the girls who have truly repented of their sins and accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior by faith. Repentance means you agree with God that you're a sinner. You agree with God that your sin is offensive to Him. You agree with God that you must ask for His forgiveness and then be willing to turn from your sins. The Greek word for repentance is metanoia. It means you change your mind about your sins. You go from loving your sin to renouncing your sin. The Bible says in Acts 3.19, Repent and be converted that your sins will be blotted out when the times of refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord. Just as your school teacher writes on the board at school and then erases that board, that's what Jesus does when we repent and turn from our sins. He erases them. He forgets them. He separates our sins from us as far as the east is from the west is what David says clearly and unequivocally in Psalm chapter 103, verse 12. Praise God, we can be forgiven. We can be cleansed of all of our sins today. And once you are, you are called a Christian. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. And the reason they were called Christians at Antioch is that the non-believers, those who were not Christians, wanted to laugh and make fun of them. And so they named them Christians, meaning they are little Christ because the way they lived reminded them of the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God when someone can laugh at you and make fun of you and mock you and by calling you a little Jesus. Yes, the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. Have you truly been born again? Do you know without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is your Lord and Savior by faith. The Bible says that we're born into sin because of the sin of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. We're born sinners. We're not born Christians. And the Bible says in Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If we continue to live in our sin without repenting and we die we are eternally separated from God and man in the place called hell. But there's an exception to that rule. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Salvation is a free gift because Jesus paid for our salvation on the cross at Calvary with His pure, sinless, spotless blood. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8 and 9, but God commends His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. God loves us so much that He sent Jesus to die on that old rugged cross at Calvary to take your sins and my sins and the sins of the world upon Himself, past, present, 
in future. Praise His holy name today. And then the Bible says that to be born again, we must accept Jesus by faith. We must accept Christ by faith. Faith is believing even though we cannot see. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, the Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Grace is God's love for you and for me that we do not deserve. And because of His love for you and for me that we do not deserve, and our faith in Him, we can be saved. You can't save yourself. I can't save you. No religious leader can save you. Only Jesus can save you. Only Jesus can be a person's Savior. Will you give Him complete control of your heart? Will you give Him complete control of your life today? In just a few moments, I'm going to give you an opportunity to make that decision. Then the Bible says that if you believe that God exists and you believe that He sent Jesus to die on the cross for your sins, and if you believe that after He died on the cross for your sins, that He was buried in a barred tomb for three days, and after three days God brought Him back to life, that's called the resurrection. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, and 10 that if you believe that, you can be saved. Will you make that decision today? And then one of the greatest verses ever written, is Romans 10, 13. For whosoever, for whosoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. All you have to do is to call on the name of Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. He will never reject you. He will never ever turn you away because He loves you with an everlasting love, a love that will not end, a love that will never ever let you go. When you call on Jesus today, He will cleanse you and forgive you of all of your sins just as if you had never, ever sinned. If you're truly born again, you are truly, eternally secure in Christ and in Christ alone. With all that is within me today, I plead with you, don't you ever, ever let anyone convince you that you can lose your salvation because you cannot. I live in the mountains of northeast Tennessee. And for generations, so many Christians, even preachers, believe and preach and teach that a person can lose their salvation. I've met so many of these individuals down through the years of my life who are broken and hurting always. They do not have the joy of Christ in their life because they believe that when they sin, they will lose the free gift of salvation that God so freely bestowed upon them when they truly repented of their sins. Today, I want you to nail this choice down, nail this decision down today that you are eternally secure in Christ and in Christ alone. The hallmark of a true child of God is that they love God with all that is within them. In Deuteronomy 6, 5, the Bible says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. I want to ask you this question today. Just listen very carefully. Do you love God this much today? Do you love Him this much today? He loves you with all that is within Him. He cannot love you any more than He loves you today, and He will never love you any less than He loves you today. Nothing more characterizes the true child of God than a genuine love for God. Redeemed people love the gracious God who has saved them. The spiritually lost, the unredeemed, they hate God. When God made His covenant with Israel through Moses, He made the distinction clear between those who love Him and those who hate Him. In Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 through 6, the Bible says this, You shall have no other gods before Me. God is speaking to the children of Israel. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. It's this simple. In God's eyes, there are two classes of people, those who have truly been born again and those who have not yet been born again. 
That's how God thinks. That's his heart. And he loves those who have never been born again as much as he loves those who have been born again. In Matthew 12, 30, Jesus states, He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Are you obedient to the call of God on your life? In Luke 6, 46, Jesus states, And why do you call me Lord, Lord? I do not do the things which I say. If you truly love God, you will do as He teaches in His holy word. In 1 Samuel 15, 22, Samuel states, and I quote, As he asked King Saul this question, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. Genuine love for God has many facets. Genuine love for God has many manifestations. Paul knew what he was talking about when under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, he penned Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. Right there where you are today, I want you to stop what you're doing right now. The Holy Spirit has convicted you, meaning He's showing you where you're wrong. He's pointing the sin out to you in your life. And today, I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray with me right now to repent of your sins and accept Christ as your Lord and Savior by faith. You just pray with me right now. Jesus is waiting on you with His loving arms open wide. He wants you to know without a shadow of a doubt that you are eternally secure in Him and in Him alone. You pray with me right now. Dear Lord Jesus, just between you and Him, dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner and I need your forgiveness. I know that you died on the cross for me. I repent. I turn from all my sins. Please forgive me. I now accept you as my Savior. And I follow you as my Lord. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and save me, I pray. I give to you, sweet Jesus, complete control of my life. Thank you for saving me. Give me the assurance and the peace that I have been saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. You've just been born again. You've gone from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. You've gone from traveling the road that's paved to eternity in the place called hell to traveling the road that's paved to beautiful eternity in the place called hell heaven. You've been forgiven of all of your sins and your name has been written down in the Lamb's book of life in heaven where it will never ever, praise God, be erased. You are eternally secure in Christ and in Christ alone. I want you to write to me today and let me know of your decision. I have some materials that I want to send to you to help you get started in your new walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to encourage you to be sure and get involved in a good balanced Bible-believing church in the community where you live and ask your pastor to baptize you. I love you. I thank God for you today. And I look forward to seeing you next time on a date with destiny.